الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا ما بعد All praises due to Allah We praise him abundantly the way he deserves to be praised And we ask Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace and send his blessings and salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Brothers and sisters in faith Welcome, welcome, welcome and hello To our fourth or fifth episode uh, discussing a very critical, sensitive, fragile, scary reality that has to do with the spouses, aka hubby and wifey, commonly referred to as hubby and wifey. Hubby to be differentiated from a hobby because some take their husbands as a hobby. Okay, okay, I'll stop. No, seriously. What does Islam say about the relationship between a husband and wife? Well, first of all, let us go back to the basics. And if we go back to the basics, we find that Allah has showed us many signs and miracles in His creation. And whether you realize it or not, one of those signs, one of those signs and miracles is the very creation of mankind and another one is the fact that he created spouses for us from ourselves وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ and from among his signs is that he created from yourselves, he created for you from yourselves, azwajan, spouses. لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا So that you may find repose in them. And second, from sukun, it's uh, the concept of tranquility. It's the concept of being neutral. That's why if you know Arabic and you know the diacritical signs, you have dhamma. Fatha, Kasra, Shadda, Sukun. Sukun is when the, si the sound is silent. It is neither A, nor U, nor E, nor M when there's a Shadda. So the fundamental thing that we should get from this ayah is that the objective of this relationship is that there should be tranquility. You should find repose and peace in that spouse of yours. Further, after Allah Azawajal made that the purpose, He then made between us وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً مَوَدَّةً from wood, which is that the, the highest level of love. That's why one of the names of Allah Azawajal is Al-Wadud, the loving. And it's, a, it's, it's more than hub. Mahabba is a kind of love. Wood is actually a greater level of love than the ordinary love. وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً And then also He made between you mercy. Because if there's no mercy between the two spouses, then they will be suffering. Verily in that are signs for people that reflect. This ayah can be elaborated on and explained and delved into in detail for, for hours, if not days and weeks. But even for the basic Muslim who will not be interested in going into the tafsir of the ulama about it just face value I think the message is pretty clear it is clear what is intended if you look into this ayah now in the light of another ayah and that's how the Quran should be understood يفهم القرآن في ضوء القرآن you understand the Quran in the light of the Quran so we don't use the ayat of Allah Azza wa Jal to make them oppose one another we use the ayat of Allah to understand them in the light of each other so when Allah says, هُنَّ لِبَاسٌ لَكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لِبَاسٌ لَهُنْ They are clothing for you and you are clothing for them. What does that mean? What do you get out of your clothing? You get from your clothing protection from the various weather conditions. You get from your clothing uh, a sense of, uh, you know, a sense of, 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 of modesty. Because your clothing cover you up, 
you get from them beautification uh, you get from them being able to uh, address the people depending on the occasions there are many many benefits that a person gets from clothing and so when Allah says that the men are like clothing to the women and the women are like clothing to their men and vice versa that means all of these meanings and all of all of these meanings that you deduce from clothing should also apply to your spouse meaning your spouse should be a form of protection for you and a form of modesty for you and a form of uh, beautification for you and those are the three main principles your spouse should provide you all of that so each one of us has to uh, when we look at the relationship between the spouses ask himself and ask yourself sister in Islam are you fulfilling those traits or are we falling short no doubt we are all falling short it is difficult to be able to be the perfect husband uh, like the Prophet وسلم, was and it's difficult to be the perfect wife like the Sahabiyat were however we have to strive in that direction what we don't want is becoming uh, you know to adapt to this carelessness wherein no effort is exerted and then we allow the culture to dictate how we deal with each other and we pretty much put up the white flag and surrender to the reality of the world that we're living in that's what we cannot do because that's what contradicts the quran and the sunnah and we've already established if anybody wants to go straight to paradise then there's no other way except one way to paradise there's one way to paradise and that is by following the quran and the sunnah according to the understanding of the early generations and so you cannot depend on your culture to resolve the issues for you. You cannot depend on your family. You cannot depend on the neighbors. You cannot depend on counselors. You cannot depend on psychiatrists and psychologists and so on and so forth. And all the stuff that the people have, uh, you know, invented and fabricated and authored books about. For the most part to twist the minds of the people rather than bring them back to the truth. Everybody has something to say. But we believe that the Qur'an and the Sunnah are sufficient. If we were to adhere to them strictly, Wallahi, you will not need anything from outside. But to Allah we complain. Ala kulli hal. Those are two ayat that I wanted to highlight and I know that you know there are more. I have lectures on this which I recommend that you watch if you want something more comprehensive. I've delivered at least three to four lectures on this topic. You can find them on my channel One Way to Paradise. Uh, one of them is uh, clothing for one another. One of them is domestic confrontations. It's very important about also, you know, the, the fights that happen between husband and wife. And then, of course, none but the, uh, the workshop we had with Kalima uh, on this issue. And I'll, I'll get you the name uh, momentarily, inshallah, uh, where we discussed uh, how to build an Islamic household. I think it was maybe five years ago or something. Ala kulli hal. Ala kulli hal, you can find all of those lectures on, on YouTube. So, but let us, let us be very straightforward right now. Now that we have the basics, let's, I want to be practical. Practical in a sense that I don't want to just theoretically speak about um, the, the rights without being able to relate them to everyday lives, uh, uh, everyday life, and then how we can actually implement them, how we can put them into practice. Let us discuss the adab uh, zawj, zawja ma zawja. What are the etiquettes that a wife should display towards her husband. First and foremost, and, and here we're going to have a lot of issues. That's why this needs a sip, sip of coffee, maybe a, a big sip of coffee. Bismillah. Before I start with this, what we don't realize is that the, the majority the majority of our Muslim sisters have been brainwashed by feminist views and principles without even being aware of that. And I am not exaggerating. You all know, alhamdulillah, I've given da'wah in many places. I've interacted with many different uh, universities and students from universities. And I get a lot of questions here and there. And anyone who's involved in da'wah that gets to interact with people from different backgrounds, different cultures, different races, they have an, an outlook on things that maybe the Muslim who's not involved in da'wah will not have. 
And there's no harm in that. There's nothing special about me or nothing missing in you. But it's just a, a reality. A person who travels, for instance, it has more general awareness than a person who doesn't travel. Simply because by traveling, you get to experience and explore and interact with various people. And I could promise you that I would say, I don't want to give a percentage. A big portion of our Muslim sisters have adopted some feminist, fundamental feminist views and either they know it or they might not even be aware of it and know it. But what you don't know is that feminism goes against Islam tooth and nail. Feminism goes against Islam tooth and nail. Why? That has to be introduced very clearly. Yes, the, the title of the thing was Towards a Blissful Home. Finally, after hours of uh, deliberating, my son decided to deliver it to me. Uh, Towards a Blissful Home, weaving it together. It's a, it's a workshop we had with Karima a few lectures back in the day. Ala kulliha. So what is feminism? Feminism is the idea that uh, women are equal to men. Uh, to men. But here's a funny thing. Here's a funny thing. It actually started off. It started off as women, women being equal to men. But today, by all means, by all means, it is women are superior to men. Women are superior. They're better in everything than men. And to the point that it had this reverse effect. It started off as women feeling underprivileged and then they wanted to be equally privileged and now they believe they are overprivileged. And the man who's now in the, in the cage being victimized and abused is the one who's getting slapped around by these women who are really men. In their attitude, in their behavior, in their appearance, in their conduct. And how can you be a, a woman of this type and a Muslim woman when the Prophet ﷺ cursed the men who resemble women and the women who resemble men? Yani by merely trying to resemble men in something that is specific to them, you automatically get the curse of Allah. The curse of Allah indicates that you will not receive the mercy of Allah. If you don't receive the mercy of Allah, you can have a hard time entering paradise. Now you could yap all you want and you could complain all you want and you can talk and talk and talk. But at the end of the day, on Yawm al Qiyamah, that's what you're going to have to deal with. So either you woman up, I'm not going to say man up, either you woman up and stop being funny or you're going to have to deal with the consequences. You will have to deal with the consequences. The people can tell you all types of stuff to make you feel better about yourself. It's all gravy, baby. But on the day of judgment, you will not be able to get by with these ideologies if they oppose the Quran and Sunnah. So my first advice to my sisters in faith, if you have adopted any of these feminist views, if you follow them, you watch them, you listen to them, please, for Allah's sake, be careful and know your role. Know your position. Know your place. Just like a man has to know his role, know his position, know his place. It is Allah who stipulates and legislates who does what and who has what power and authority, not us. Wallahi, thumma wallahi, thumma wallahi. If Allah commanded that the men remain at home and wash dishes and look after the children and women go out and work, wallahi, we would sit at home. We will not oppose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not about superior and inferior and it's about what did Allah say did Allah legislate did Allah reveal this Sami'na wa ata'na ghufranaka rabbana wa ilayka al-masir we listen and we obey and we seek your forgiveness so Allah to you is the return that's just, it's very straightforward so don't think because in your mind you think oh well of course you're a man and as a man of course you're going to be saying this ya shaykh not because I'm a man even if I was a battikha if I was a watermelon speaking to you right now, I'm neither male nor female. I'm an it. If that batikha tells you, Allah said, then you should obey. I am not trying to champion the cause of men. Woo, I'm a man, yay! Menism. Feminism, menism. I don't have this nonsense and this junk anywhere. And no Muslim in his right mind should.
Um, so fundamentally speaking, I hope I am clear because, because I, I've, I've dealt with this before and I have a lecture on this. I wish you would listen to this lecture. This lecture is titled, The male is unlike the female. It's based on an ayah in the Quran. And the male is unlike the female. And it was based on the idea that they want women to lead the salah, they want women to give khutbah, they want women to be the ruler of the country, they want women to be the madri ish wadri ish. And we discussed this because of the, a lot of heat that I received five, six, seven, eight years ago, let alone today. Where people until now, the sister, when she complains about her husband, she doesn't complain about her husband from the perspective that Islam wants him to do and he doesn't do. She complains about her husband from a feminist fundamental point of view. Not based on the religion, based on that. And again, I'm, I'm not here to attack women. Wallahi, I'm not here. I'm, I'm going to give the men their share, believe me. But in this case, because the context requires that, and because this is a prelude to what I will say later, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. And because in our era, the, what, is, what is available contemporary is feminism. That's what the issue we're dealing with. So that's why I'm addressing it. Not because I'm trying to pick on the women versus the men. It's because that is the issue at hand. So that's why I'm going to begin by saying the first etiquette and expectation is that the wife must obey her husband. Ta'a. Obedience. As long as he's commanding her to obey Allah. Otherwise, we know لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخالق. There should be no obedience to creation if it entails disobeying Allah. But if he's commanding her to do anything which is halal, it becomes obligatory on the woman to fulfill it. The Prophet ﷺ said, إذا صلت المرأة خمسها If the woman pray her five daily prayers. Look, this is the most simplified, straightforward hadith that I've come across in the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu It to me, it's one of the most straightforward hadith and it makes the life of women so much simpler than us men, in my opinion. And I see this as here, Islam, favoring women over men. And if it's from Allah, we say, we listen, we obey. Alhamdulillah. If Allah wants to make this easy like this for the woman, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, I will never object to Allah. You shouldn't either. He said, if the woman prays her five daily prayers, وَصَامَتْ شَهْرَهَا And if she fasts her month of Ramadan, we are now in the month of Ramadan, وَحَصَّنَتْ فَرْجَهَا And she protected her private parts. Sorry for the explicit terms, but this is the hadith. وَأَطَاعَتْ بَعْلَهَا And she obeys her husband. دَخَلَتْ مِنْ أَيِّ أَبْوَابِ الْجَنَّةِ شَاءَتْ She will enter Jannah from whichever door she likes. Think about it. Do you know what we have to go through? Do you know the hadith of Abu Bakr Siddiq? Prophet said, who attended the janazah today? He said, I did. He said, who gave sadaqah today? He said, I did. Who, he, he mentioned a number of acts of worship. And Abu Bakr said, I did, I did, I did. He said, whoever does all of those in a day, then he will enter Jannah from whichever door he wants. There were so many acts of, and visited a sick person and so on and so forth. How many of us do this per day? No, almost none. A woman... Her simplified path to Jannah is pray five daily prayers and you are exempted when you have your menstruation. So that's a time out for you. Fast the month of Ramadan. Don't commit any act of, of, of adultery or fornicate, uh, uh, act of adultery. Obey your husband and go to Jannah from whichever door you want. Hey, what else do you want, Ya Shaykha? But see, what is the fundamental point here? Is obeying her husband. Now, I'm saying this because believe it or not, now the, the, the good sisters right now that are listening, they have absolutely no problem with this. And there are people right now who may be listening who are not at ease with the word obedience. Like it's so heavy on their heart, like obey? Why do I have to obey? Who is he for me to obey him? This attitude, this mode of thinking, that feminist mode of thinking is detrimental and is very, very destructive to your relationship with Allah. So please, be merciful to yourself. Anyways, look how easy it is. Secondly, uh, she should uh, have a good companionship with him, be available to him, so much so that the Prophet ﷺ said that a woman should not fast voluntarily without seeking permission from her husband. 
لا يحل لامرأة أن تصوم وزوجها شاهد إلا بإذنه. You may not fast voluntarily and your husband is not uh, absent because he might uh, want, uh, want you to be available to him and if you're fasting you're obviously not available to him and that contradicts one of his rights so you may not even fast. You see how you get closer to Allah with the ibadah of fasting? You cannot, this Islam showing you the reality of the relationship between husband and wife. Similarly, you should not permit anyone into his house that he does not allow. Uh, and so this is one of the fundamental rights of the husband. Thirdly, that you should look after his uh, wealth and his property. So you always try to utilize whatever uh, wealth he has properly. Some women, unfortunately, they, they have a, a spending uh, disease. And every time they go out shopping, mashallah, tabarakallah, they need four or five cars to load up all of the stuff that they bought. And that stuff is really not necessary. So her husband is, is like working night and day to make ends meet. And the sister spends it on makeup and, and beautification and things that are unnecessary. There has to be moderation. There has to be moderation. Of course, a woman is, should beautify herself and should... Uh, you know, invest into her, her appearance and her makeup and whatever she needs to look beautiful and feel beautiful, no doubt. But some women, as you know, go overboard in that and you are expected to have moderation in all of that. Fifthly, to manage the household. That's another issue that some of the sisters have. They say, what's the evidence that uh, I have to uh, clean, uh, wash the dishes, and I have to clean, and I have to do the laundry. What's the evidence that this and that? The evidence is that the Prophet ﷺ had a daughter that was very beloved to him. And Fatima actually came to the Prophet ﷺ complaining about how, how she was not even able to manage the house chores. She had so much to do that it was beyond her. She was getting tired. And she asked the Prophet ﷺ to get her a maid. And the Prophet ﷺ refused and said, Instead, let me teach you before you go to sleep to say SubhanAllah 33 times, Alhamdulillah 33 times, and Allahu Akbar 34 times. That indicates that that's what it is. Similarly, this is something established among the scholars. Khidmat to zawj looking after him, is a responsibility among the women. Now, of course, culturally that may vary. In some cultures, there's a higher expectation. In other cultures, there's a lower expectation that the culture can actually get involved in that to some degree. But the fundamental principle is that the wife has the obligation to look after the house and it is highly recommended for the husband to aid and assist like the Prophet ﷺ used to do. He would get, get involved in looking after the household. Sixthly, she should have a, a good relationship with him and her in-laws. And I can go on forever discussing the issue of the in-laws. It's a, it's, a, it's a phenomenon that the people love to joke about. It's the biggest joke in the world. You know, the, the joke of the mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law. Yeah, jama'at al-khair, that is not for Islam and Muslims. We don't have, we should not have this issue. Your mother-in-law is your husband's mother. And he has a, a serious obligation towards her and you should help her. That said, ya akhi. Your mother is not your wife's mother. Your mother or brother is not your wife's mother. So to make your wife look after your mother like it's her job is also ludicrous. And it is not obligatory on the woman to look after your parents. If she does it out of the, the goodness of her heart, Jazahallahu khairan. But if it's a burden on her, then she does not have the obligation. Unfortunately, in some cultures, the mother runs the house. And the daughter-in-law who, for the most part, lives with her mother-in-law is like a slave in her own house. And the mother says, you know, go up, uh, go down, do push-ups, do sit-ups, crunches, jump in jacks, jump out the window, come back from the balcony, uh, wash, do, go, yeah, hey, yo, hello, mother-in-law, calm down, what's going on here? Uh, this is in your own house, or this is with your own child, but your daughter-in-law doesn't have this obligation towards you. Where are the matters of Islam anyways in treatment between the people, between relatives, whether it is blood or through, through a marriage? Now let's come and be nice to each other. The mother-in-law should treat the daughter-in-law kindly, with love and compassion. 
and the mother-in-law should treat her, uh, the daughter-in-law should treat her mother-in-law with love and compassion. And the husband should be a facilitator between both. That side with his wife against his mother, side with his mother against his wife. Like little children all day fighting in a kindergarten school. My seer had al-kalam ya jama'ah. Wallah, we hear crazy stories. The, the number of times I've received messages from, from sisters in Islam complaining about her mother-in-law and what they've done to them. It, like some of them beat them, ya sheikh. Physically beat them. That's insanity right there. Allah breaks the heart. Seventhly, she shouldn't command or she shouldn't expect from her husband or demand. There you go. She shouldn't demand from her husband more than he can bear. Yani some sisters, all they do is nag and nag and nag and I want and what about this? Look, the neighbors got a new car and they have a new house and they have a new furniture and what about this and what about that? Yani if the husband is capable, alhamdulillah, if he's not capable, you take it easy on the man. Take it easy on the man. Look at Aisha, anha, how, how patient she was. The, the, the house she had the Prophet is when he wanted to pray, there was no room to pray. Her legs will be in the way when he used to make sujood. How big was the, was the house of Aisha? It's a tiny little place. Now we all live lavishly, ya jama'at al-khair. Most of us live lavish. If you're watching me right now, meaning you have a phone and internet and laptop and computer and you're sitting at home and you have electricity and you have, you have, you have, you have Wi-Fi, 4G, 5G, whatever you have, meaning you're, for the most part, you're, you're alhamdulillah, doing fine. Like, we're spoiled. So the sister should take it easy on the husband. Don't worry, the husband's your turn is coming. Uh, eighthly, she should also share with her husband his feelings, his emotions, and his concerns, and his stress. Some sisters are wild, man. The husband will be, you know, tired at work, and he just came back from a very bad day. And then as soon as she comes home, she adds, <laughs> she adds a few other layers on top of that until his, his, his hair becomes gray in 15 minutes. He comes out three years older than when he came in. No mercy. Or he's stressing out and she's sitting there, you know, laughing with her friends and uh, having a tea party and relaxing. And he's looking for a wall to smash his head against. Now, out of consideration, يعني, even if you're having the time of your life, you need to be able to uh, contain yourself out of consideration for this man. So when he's happy, share him the moments of happiness. And when he is upset, then be considerate enough not to be negligent of how he feels. Of course, this always applies. Most of the stuff I'm saying, brothers and sisters, applies both ways. Needless to say, I know you're smart enough to figure that out. Eighthly, and that is the most dangerous of all, and it does require a sip of coffee, Bismillah. Ibn Abbas narrated that the Prophet ﷺ said, what the Prophet ﷺ said, I was allowed, I was made to see the fire. I saw the fire. And I saw that the majority of the inhabitants of the fire were women disbelieving. Yakfur. So the Sahaba said, you mean they will be disbelievers in Allah? He said, Yakfur al-Ashir. No, they will be disbelievers in the companionship and in the goodness of their husbands. Yakfur nahir. Uh, it is not the disbelief or the denial of Allah, it's the, the rejection of the bounty of Allah. So if Allah gives you a blessing and you don't acknowledge it, this is called kufr ni'ma linguistically and legislatively. So here it means that they are unappreciative. The, the comprehensive English term is unappreciative. These women are unappreciative. The Prophet ﷺ said, if you treat one of them you're a lifetime, you give them a lifetime of goodness, a lifetime of offering, then she will see something from you that she doesn't like. She will turn around and say, I've never seen anything good from you, Ya Sheikh. Now, sisters, be real with yourselves. How many times 
have you felt that way? Or have you said that at a moment of anger, at a moment of dissatisfaction, at a moment of conflict with your husband? Whether you say it, or whether you feel it, or whether you, you insinuate it, that this man's hard work and effort has been thrown in the trash and washed down in the drain and gone with the wind because of his issue, whatever that issue may be. Whatever that issue may be. Unfortunately, this is a quality that many women have and that quality will lead to the hellfire. So sisters in faith, when you are upset, dissatisfied, angry with your husband, you have to be very careful what you say. Be careful what you say, lest you say, as we know from the other hadith, that you say a kalima. You don't pay attention to it, it will throw you in Jahannam for 70 years. Min sakhatillah, a word that Allah is displeased with. So please, be careful of that generalization. Be careful of that generalization and that, you know, the, the blanket statements. That's what I'm looking for, blanket statements. You never take care of the children. You never madri ish, come home on time. You never, ish you never. Marhaba you never. This happened five, six, seven times and a million times it didn't happen. How can the six times become equal to a million times? It's, a, it's an issue of curiosity. Hey, nine. That you should conceal the secrets of your husband and you should conceal his, his weaknesses and deficiencies from the people. And this is another calamity. Now all sisters do, they have groups on WhatsApp for this. My husband, all day they whine and complain about their husband. They expose him to the whole ummah. Yani they don't leave anyone they don't expose him to. And you are obliged to conceal the secrets of your husband. And if he has some defects, shh. Don't publicize them. So when you're, at, when you're sharing this with your sisters, just for the sake of sharing, you're actually falling into this issue. You're falling into this issue. The only exception is if you're asking a qualified sheikh, a mufti, a scholar, a, 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 someone you know, who can advise you, then obviously you have to ask. And it's always better to say if a woman has a problem with her husband because he said da-da-da-da, don't even make it about you. You only mention yourself if it is of utmost necess necessity. But you don't expose him. So the exception is when you seek an advice. If you're not seeking advice, don't. And if you want to get advice from the sisters, also say generally. What do you guys say about, I know, I know a person. When you say, I know a person, I know a sister, you're talking about yourself. Don't you know yourself? That's actually one of the times when you can use these words and it's not lying. You're not lying. When you say, I know a sister whose husband you know, does such and such and such. Yes, you, either you know another sister or you're speaking about yourself. The truth is, you know a sister and you are that sister. You don't have to say, my husband you know, is blah, blah, blah. He oppresses me, he mistreats me, he midrishu, you mop the floor with his, uh, with his uh, dignity uh, until anywhere he goes, people spit on him uh, because of your kindness and, and, and love. مَا يَجِي هَذَا الْكَلَامِ مَا يَسْتَقِيمْ هَذَا الْكَلَامِ Tenthly, you should beautify yourself for him uh, and be ready for him anytime he wants you for himself if you know what I'm saying. And making yourself unavailable is a serious, ser serious violation. So much so that Prophet ﷺ said, if a man calls his wife to come with him and she does not, she refuses and he remains angry with her, the angels will curse her until the morning. Now, the brother also has to have some reason, reasonability and, and consideration. If you see that she's not in uh, the best condition, yani spare her. Don't put her in a predicament where she has to say no, and then you have this issue. Try to, yani, try to avoid putting her in this predicament. But if that were to take place, sister, please, you better know the right of your husband. And a lot of sisters are lazy. They want to be in the mood, and they want to be in the I don't know what, and there has to be a dinner, and a flower, and a candlelight, and they have to go, to, like the, they watch a few movies in Jahiliya, and they want, the, they want to replay the movie every time. Come on. It doesn't work this way. The matter is much simpler. So keep it simple. 
And the husband, of course, يعني, have mercy on your wife as well. Anyways, your, 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 your uh, turn is coming. For the husband. First of all, you should be aware of the fact that uh, your wife it, it, it comes, or the women, come from a, a, a bent rib. The Prophet ﷺ described the woman as such. If you try to straighten it, it will break. If you try to straighten it, it will break. And if you keep it crooked and bent, then it will remain crooked and bent. So at all times when you're dealing with your wife, you have to understand that she is not you. Talking to myself and everybody. Your wife is not you. The male is unlike the female. Your wife is not going to be like you. So don't expect a man-to-man -man communication, a man-to-man -man understanding, a man-to-man -man because we think differently. 100% we think differently. Men are uh, materialistic and logical. Women are emotional. Women are emotional and that's fine. That's how they're supposed to be. You don't blame them because Allah created them that way. It's our job to modify our behavior according to how women are. If you go beyond the norm of trying to straighten her, you will break her and breaking her is divorce and then you did not accomplish anything in your life in that sense. So you have to know how to manage the situation. Then the Prophet said, the, the, the vessels, the, the women are fragile vessels, so you have to act accordingly. Do not be, think that because you're the man, that means you are Adolf Hitler, dealing with the uh, Jews in the Nazi uh, Germany. A lot of the brothers are, are Hitler times six. Hitler, Stalin, and uh, I don't know who else. Yeah, Sheikh, your manhood is ala rasi wa aini, but your manhood is actually displayed outside, is displayed at work. Because if you're, a, if you're a, a, a chicken in front of the boss and a lion in front of your wife, then ma'alish yani, you didn't accomplish much in terms of manhood. Now either you're a lion here and there or you're a chicken here and there. So to, to, because you have authority over the woman, you, you abuse that is also unfair for the sisters. And most of the sisters, their main suffering is from an abusive husband who does not fear Allah with his wife. He does not maintain the rights of Allah in his treatment of his wife. Now, no one is going to ace it all the way. But there should be times when you fall short. But for the vast majority of time, you should keep things in check. So the first advice to the brothers is your wife is under your care, under your responsibility. Therefore, you're there to look after her, to protect her, to nurture her. You're not there to dictate what she does and to oppress her and abuse her. If you do so, then you are dealing with oppression and oppression is not something that is light on the shoulders of, of mankind. So we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to rectify our condition and make it easy upon us to fulfill the rights that are due to us and do due, uh, due to others on us. That's first. Second of all, what is the objective of your relationship with your wife? What are you both striving for? A lot of times people get married because, well, you're supposed to get married. They don't actually enter into the marriage with the right principles and foundations. In Islam, we have an objective behind marriage. Marriage is half of your deen. You have half of your deen, and for you to fulfill the other half, you need to have a spouse, because the spouse will allow you to produce children, and the children will increase the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu So there's an Islamic legislative objective behind marriage. It's not merely cultural uh, uh, performance cultural behavior, as it is the case with many other people who do get married. So if we come from this principle and this understanding, and we have a target, the target is to help one another enter paradise. We need to help one another enter paradise. 
So every time you want to deal with your wife, you have to put that target between your eyes. Right there. Look at it. Because if you have that as the, as the scale by which you determine what you do and what decisions you make, then inshallah ta'ala, you will make the right decisions accordingly. If you don't, you will wind up forgetting the purpose of marriage. And that means for you to be able to last in this relationship, there has to be compromises. You must compromise. The Prophet sallallahu said, a believing man should never hate his, his believing wife. If you actually dislike a quality of hers, you will find many other qualities that you like. If there's a quality of her that you dislike, you will find many other qualities that you like. So a woman has a shortcoming. She's uh, oversensitive. She's emotional. She's this or she's that. You have to keep that in mind and treat your wife accordingly. Look at the good qualities that she has and, and invest into those. Uh, praise her for those. Support her to become better. Don't be an auditor or an officer looking for her mistakes and shortcomings because if you go going to take that route then guess what buddy you have your own set of issues as well and if the relationship between the husband and wife becomes pointing fingers at each other you did this no you did that this is your problem you don't do this you don't do that then you will have a war zone at home you will not have the sakina that Allah Azza wa had intended for us there will be no sakina and there will be no mawadda and there will be no rahmah. So you always have to bring the ayat to mind. That the objective of the household is sakina. The objective is there should be mawadda, love and compassion and mercy between us. So be merciful to your wife. Be merciful to her as much as you're able to. When we have these proper etiquettes fulfilled, when there are kind words, women are very easy to please sometimes. And I know not every man is able to say, I love you. Not every man has the ability, but those words go a long way with women. If you cannot say it, ya akhi, type it in a message. Write it on a piece of paper. Express it in some way. A lot of the problems that happen between a husband and wife can be solved with a hug. Women are, are in that manner very effective. Yeah, and you can have a very long argument and you could, if you want to logically argue, you will win the argument. But actually, you can win the argument by just giving her a hug and then case closed. Sometimes women, they want attention. They want from the husband to, to any type of interaction. You're too busy with your phone, too busy with your work, too busy with whatever. And in order to get your attention for a long time, it requires that there's an argument. So understand that sometimes the intention is not that the woman is trying to give you a hard time. She's just trying to get some, she wants you to show her some love. So do like the Prophet ﷺ did, show some love. Don't you know that the Prophet ﷺ, you know, when Aisha would eat from a place, he would look from where she ate and he would eat from the same place? Yani this is how the Prophet ﷺ showed love in his own way. It doesn't have to be that some of, some of us are OCD. Personally, I can't. It's a matter of a preference. But the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us this is his way of showing love. And there are hundreds and thousands of ways, whichever way you prefer. As long as you're showing love to the woman, then your relationship with this will be successful. So my advice to both spouses is always remind each other that, that you appreciate each other. Appreciation is the most fundamental quality that both spouses must have to be successful. When a woman is unappreciative to the husband or the husband is unappreciative to his wife, then both will feel unfulfilled. When you feel unfulfilled, you start looking for fulfillment elsewhere. When you look for fulfillment elsewhere, then you will fail your original contract. You will fail in that relationship. So it's about fulfillment. How much fulfillment are we doing? Sister, how much effort are you putting into beautifying yourself and making sure that you're available to your husband so that he does not have to look outside? Ask yourself that question. And brother, it doesn't mean that you smell, you smell like a pair of socks that haven't been washed in six weeks and you look like squash and cucumbers that were put together in one jar. It doesn't mean that you can walk around with your, you know, tanked up with the 16 holes in it and, you know, you, you, you smell 
and you think that you are some Leonardo DiCaprio type of guy and that your wife is just going to be head over heels for you even 20 years after marriage. No, Habibi. No, your brother. You have an obligation to beautify yourself before your wife just like she has the obligation to beautify herself before you. You also have to look after yourself and you have to look good. You have to smell good. You have to dress good. You have to impress her like she has to impress you. If we exert our energy into impressing one another instead of exerting in that energy into highlighting each other's mistakes, then we would have solved 80% of the problems in the household. But for the most part, we don't have a Muslim household because we don't fulfill these obligations. So in conclusion, I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to help us have the proper relationship with our spouses, to help the Ummah have the proper relationship so we can raise children upon the deen, so those children will be the ones whom Allah Azza wa Jal will allow this Ummah to flourish and be uh, prosperous through them. So that we can make the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam proud. That we in this era, in this generation where Islam has become really strange among the people, that we are making some effort and striving to make this religion and practice it in its pure sense. And for us to do so, we have to obey the Prophet ﷺ in regards to this marital relationships. And that means that the sisters uh, give up on their feminist, uh, fundamental, uh, fundamentalist, radical views. And the brother gives up on being the Hitler of the household. If each one of us did, does that, then we can go a long way, inshallah. هذا والله أعلم جزاكم الله خير وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد